Well, hello there. Today I wanted to talk about a concert I recently had the pleasure of attending, which was Radiohead. This is the second time I've gotten to see them. The first was about five years ago, and both concerts I attended with my friend Miles, who is one of those people who knows all the obscure cuts, like all the B-sides off of the obscure singles, all the lost tracks. So it was very enriching both times to uh, see this band perform with him. But this time around, we had a little incident before actually getting to the venue. We were looking for parking, and I accidentally uh, crashed my car into public transit. Nobody was hurt, thankfully, and neither vehicles were damaged very much, but we had to follow procedure, and so we lost about an hour getting to the venue, which wasn't terrible because they didn't have a opening band, and they took a while to set up. We still killed about a half hour at the venue before they started playing, so it, it all worked out, I guess. So let me talk a little bit about the uh, stage setup, which was interesting this time around. They had a series of, um, I hesitate to call them disco balls, but these lighting orbs that were at the back of the stage that seemed to output corpuscular rays and could move. So you had these pillars of light that like filled the space orbiting around, and they looked solid, like solid pillars of light projected from these things, and they would oscillate and move around, and uh, quite frankly, they got in my eyes a couple of times, but it was very impressive, and served sort of the dual purpose of hiding the band at points, because I know a lot of, um, a lot of performing artists don't like photos being taken of them, or they want to keep things focused on the music. I've seen this before with A Perfect Circle, who will play with minimal lighting on the stage, or like obscure the figures of the band members in various ways. Nine Inch Nails are infamous for having their um, curtain of LEDs that will obscure the band to silhouettes amongst all this, like, what looks like uh, TV static. But uh, in this case, Radiohead had their, their crazy, crazy orbs and a giant sort of oval um, TV set that was live feeding a collage of images of the band performing in real time. Other than that, there wasn't too much ornamentation to the stage, and it was wide open for Tom York to do his funny little dances and freakouts. Um... From a gear standpoint, I noticed that they had uh, LEDs installed underneath there and on their pedal boards so they could see what they were doing because the stage was kept kind of dark for the most part. So I'll start getting into the set list here. They opened the show with Daydreaming, which is the second track off of their most recent album, and kind of a odd choice for an opener. It's a song that is kind of stark in its lack of um, highs and lows. It's very much this low-key, dreary, somber sort of a song. It doesn't really make a huge impact, and because the song is so kind of still in many ways, the problems with the mix started showing up right on that first song where they had Tom's vocals set way too high compared to the other instrumentation that was very subtle. You want to like keep those things kind of bring them together. And I know that uh, the way the mix sounds often depends on where you are at the venue. In our case, we were up pretty high and uh, off to the side, close to stage left. So for all I know, uh, the speakers could have been aimed primarily uh, out towards the rest of the audience, and we were just not getting as good of a projection. We ended up finding different seating for the second encore because... Like idiots, we started to leave and then heard them uh, come back on. We heard the cheering, and so we uh, we ducked into a different section, and those seats were a lot better acoustically, I think. 
Now, the set list in general had a lot more variety than the first time that I saw them. Back in like 2013, I think is when I saw them last, they, um, they were touring the album King of Limbs, which is um, uh, not a fan favorite album and certainly not one of my favorites either. Um, and when you're touring a record, you tend to play a lot of stuff from that particular album because you're kind of trying to push it and see what fans are reacting to from it. But this time around, they really dug into their back catalog. Tom York, uh, their lead singer, is kind of notoriously unhappy and more specifically doesn't like to play a lot of the band's older material or at least has in the past because I'd heard rumors for a while that he was starting to lighten up about that and that they were being more active about playing some of the hits and not just the really experimental stuff that the band have done in their later years. So when we saw them previously, the only track that the band played from their entire like 90s catalog was Karma Police, which closed out both that concert and this concert. But this time around, really early into the set list, they dug into No Surprises off of The Bends, their uh, their second record. And as they moved through the songs in their set list, it seemed like they were really trying to think about what songs from each era they wanted to put together. Because they, uh, they started the day off with a bunch of tracks off their newest album, A Moon Shaped Pool, that moved through a range of emotions, and then shifted things over to a couple of older tracks, shifted back up to some newer stuff, some more obscure stuff, and it felt like the set list bounced around like that, where they were picking two to th four songs in a row that were from a similar era, but would bring out different vibes from that era. So it was it was a really, really good set list overall. Like, again, tons of variety, they uh, they played a couple more obscure songs that I'm really into, particularly The Daily Mail, which is this bombastic non-album cut that they put out uh, this decade that really sounded drastically different from a lot of the studio work that they've been doing for the last 10 years. Kind of had a throwback vibe, very uh, piano ballad descending into like horns and anthemic rock. Now, one of the really cool things that we saw last time around was um, when they were touring the King of Limbs, which is a very um, synthetic, very repetitive album built around uh, looping samples. When the band played those tracks live, they really transformed and took on a different life. So even though they were touring a album I didn't personally like, there was a intrigue going on there of not really knowing how the songs are going to translate, and in some ways that made the concert that I saw previously a little bit better than this one, was that my expectations were kind of low and they surpassed them drastically. Whereas this time around, like... It was nice that they were playing a lot of the sing-along hits, because Radiohead don't have a lot of those. But uh, at the same time, it left a little bit to be desired in some ways, because I was really hoping for a transformative experience that really wasn't going to happen in that live setting, this time around at least. Another feature that I was acutely aware of this time was the age demographic at the concert. Me and Miles were some of the youngest people that I saw there, um, usually by a decade or more. There's a lot of gray hairs showing up, and quite frankly, the ticket prices were prohibitively expensive. We were in the fucking nosebleed seats. Granted, nosebleed seats that were closer to the stage than many, but those were still prohibitively expensive. Um, I didn't actually ask my friend Miles to pay me back because of his financial circumstances and instead just had him pay for parking and concessions while we were there because, whoa boy, those were, um, those were not cheap. Something that comes with the territory of an older audience as well is the sort of stiffness that comes with that. 
both uh, times that I saw Radiohead, not a lot of people were dancing. And particularly when I saw them in 2013, King of Limbs is a surprisingly danceable record since it's based around loops and was very rhythmically focused. So we actually had somebody come from across the stadium to come dance with us because we were the only people dancing in the high rises that time. And so this time around, I didn't see too many people either in the stands or down on the floor really moving too much to this. And I get that that's a thing that comes with age. I'm starting to feel it in my bones, too. But uh, I guess as a consolation, when they did Karma Police... Pretty much everyone was singing along, but then the rest of the band left, and Tom York basically conducted a sing-along of, uh, like, a reprise of Karma Police after they had all left, where it was just him and an acoustic guitar, and he was letting the audience sing it out, and, you know, I hope that he's in a good place. I hope this is indicative of him having a, like, better, healthier mentality, fitter, happier, not a pig in a stall on antibiotics, or however that quote goes. Ugh. I'm like the only person who doesn't like OK Computer, and I just, I never say it in front of people who are into Radiohead, but like, that album is just so toxic and depressing in its mood that I don't venture much outside of the big hits from it. So yeah, I hope uh, I hope Tom York is feeling feeling good and able to rest a little on his legacy and enjoy his legacy, because Radiohead are a band that have consistently done good work and not had lineup changes in over twenty years. So you know, not many bands get to do that, be critically acclaimed, constantly evolve, and all that good shit. So. Uh, you know, they're they're an exciting, exciting band. But I felt simultaneously super old and super young at this concert. And uh, despite the uh, tr- unfortunate incident beforehand, I really had a good time. And yeah, thanks for listening to me talk about uh, this concert. And hopefully I'll be hitting up a few more shows soon and have more things to say. Mbrah!